to all of you for also to all of you for um, uh, permitting me the 24 hour delay in, in speaking. Uh, one of the side effects of switching jobs uh, is that one is 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 um, apt to lose control of their calendar. And so I, I deeply apologize for that. And I'm really thrilled that I'm going to get the opportunity to talk uh, with all of you uh, today. So let me share my screen. All right, you're able to see the screen. Yeah. Great. Well, I will. Um, I will save uh, the introduction uh, because uh, you already heard uh, quite a bit about about the, my background, and and I'm going to jump kind of right into the research. And, and then if there's time, and I, I expect there will be, um, I, I will tell you a little bit more about what what we started doing at the at the Rockefeller Foundation, the Pandemic Prevention Institute. Um, I do I do want to stress, uh, especially since we're recording, uh, that. Uh, the work I'm talking about today is is a product of my academic research and is does not represent the opinions of of the Rockefeller Foundation. One of the things that we're all wrestling to understand, and in particular, try to understand at the Pandemic Prevention Institute and many similar efforts uh, globally is why COVID-19 uh, became a pandemic. And we certainly understand that uh, some of this had to do with the decisions that were made in places like the United States around um, how to deploy or not deploy testing. Uh, we know that this is wrapped up in the global effects of racism, xenophobia, violence against indigenous populations that lead to health disparities uh, and vulnerability when it comes to, to transmission of pathogens. We know it's because of the uh, role of infodemics, uh, the interconnected populations. Uh, however, we also prepared in many ways, especially in countries like the US and across uh, Europe and, and UK, we prepared for the wrong kind of pathogen. Most of our infectious disease response as it pertains to pandemics is focused uh, at the public health level around influenza and diseases like Ebola, which are quite different uh, from, uh, from SARS-CoV-2. And I think that what SARS-CoV-2 has really revealed is that at the public health level, we need more uh, complex systems, complex networks, uh, integrative thinking and modeling that includes uh, behavioral response, that includes uh, information on how policy decisions are going to be made and how they'll be received, uh, that includes uh, the interaction between the pathogen and the host and what's going to happen uh, both at ecological or epidemiological timescales, but evolutionary timescales. So one of the things that we're seeing play out uh, with these variants is that um, for viruses, at least as it pertains to our own timescale, the evolutionary processes and ecological processes happen basically at the same rate. There is no separation of time scales anymore. And so we are both fighting an evolutionary battle uh, and an ecological or, or uh, epidemiological battle, in addition to having to understand how all of this uh, interacts with behavior um, and understanding that this is a closed uh, loop where the behavior feeds back on the virus, the virus feeds back on the behavior uh, in, in an interconnected way. And so, um, you know, in broad strokes, the thesis is that COVID-19 became a pandemic because the world uh, doesn't understand complex systems and how, uh, how to manage them and respond. And of course, I've alluded to this a bit already. And I think one of the things that's really exciting about this workshop and, and the work that so many of you are engaged in and, and many people on this call have, have contributed um, immensely to, to this way of thinking is that for an infectious disease, its emergent property, namely a pandemic or an epidemic, is going to be a function of things like uh, the population level characteristics uh, related to household distributions, related to poverty, related to the systemic effects of racism uh, and other forms of violence. It's going to be, it's going to be affected by our contact patterns, by our social networks, airline travel, road travel, train travel. In addition, it's going to be impacted by human behavior and by the evolution. 
of the pathogen, and none of these can be reduced out and moved to the side or controlled in isolation because this is the kind of complex system where you have to understand how all of these parts uh, fit together and interact to result in a pandemic or an epidemic. And then uh, how, if you choose to intervene on one of these, you will be simultaneously uh, interacting with all of the other features. Um, and if you do not have an understanding for that, models for that, the ability to uh, rapidly adjust course, the kinds of data systems that provide you with the real-time situational awareness you need to make decisions, uh, that your interventions are not going to work and in fact may exacerbate uh, the situation. Of course, we're seeing that play out uh, in the United States right now uh, around the politic, 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 I can't say the word, around uh, how political uh, things like mask wearing has become and the lack of, of importance placed on how our messaging needs to uh, acknowledge the way in which some of these policies uh, have become uh, so, so political. In addition, the other feature of COVID-19 that really challenges a lot of the modeling paradigms is that the kind of variability that we see uh, transcends geographic scales. And so this is an outdated uh, plot by months, uh, months and months ago, uh, but the pattern has been consistent since January of 2020, that if you look globally, there are some countries that are experiencing really intense local epidemics and other countries uh, that are not. If we just take a single country like the United States and look at within the country, and this is true for, we can pick any of the countries uh, on the globe and look inside of the country and you will see similar levels of heterogeneity uh, regionally across the country in terms of places that are experiencing larger uh, or smaller outbreaks. Um, and then if we continue uh, to, oh, and I don't have a, an additional plot here. If we continue to zoom in, I usually have another plot of uh, zooming in on Massachusetts and then Boston where I live, is if we zoom in on the state levels, so go into the regional parts of the country, you see heterogeneity that mirrors that at the national level and international level. And then if you go into the city level, you see that again. So the first waves of COVID in Boston uh, back in March of 2020, the average across the city was probably 15% of the population infected, uh, but that's some neighborhoods with one to 2% and some other neighborhoods that are right across the street almost at 15, 20, 30%. And we see a similar pattern uh, with vaccination. It's part of what explains the current uh, outbreak structure in the United States, heterogeneity uh, at the state level, at the city level, at the within state level and vaccination. Again, to go back to Massachusetts, Massachusetts is above the US average in terms of vaccines delivered. But in part, that's because Boston uh, is some, somewhere like 80% of eligible people, 90% are vaccinated. Whereas in the capital in Springfield, uh, it's below the national average in the 40s. Um, and similar to states like Louisiana and, and Mississippi in terms of their average. And of course, we know globally uh, that uh, there is massive uh, inequality uh, when it comes to vaccine availability. Um, however, the landscape of this is, is complicated, right? So we know that individuals can travel to countries in many cases and receive a vaccine. And so the wealthiest individuals in most countries have probably been vaccinated because they are able to uh, either secure vaccines in their own country or travel to countries where they can, they can get the vaccine. In the United States, um, and I'll show you this here, that both uh, the effects of racism and the effects of income can be seen uh, on the vaccination coverage. And so the place where I have the best data is in Massachusetts. So each dot here is a city or town uh, across the state of, uh, of Massachusetts in the US. And on the x-axis, this is the percent of that city or state uh, that identifies as Black or African American uh, or of uh, Hispanic uh, descent. And then the percent uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2 uh, up through um, you know, a few weeks ago. And so what you can see is this very strong pattern uh, 
of, of higher and higher and higher percent infected as you have increasingly uh, high percentage um, Black or Hispanic in that city. If you look at the association with income, again, on the x-axis, we have the median household income of each city or town, which are the dots. And on the y-axis, this is the percent infected with SARS-CoV-2. And so those individuals in the lowest income cities and towns have much, much higher uh, infection rates than individuals in the highest incomes. And part of this is because of one's ability to uh, isolate when sick uh, because of household sizes. This is one's ability to quarantine. This is one's ability to work from home instead of having to go into the workplace. However, we can actually disentangle this and see that most of this effective income uh, is, is an interaction with race ethnicity. And so I had the same plot as before with the percent infected with SARS-CoV-2 on the y-axis, the median household income on the x-axis, each dot is a city or town in the state of Massachusetts. And then I just colored them uh, by um, the quartile of that city across the state with percent black Hispanic going from zero to 3%, three to five, five to eight and a half and eight and a half to 82 percent. And you can see that in the court, the three quartiles below 8.5%, there's no relationship. That line is flat just through a cloud of points between income uh, and percent infected with SARS-CoV-2. However, in this quartile that is above uh, 8.5 percent Black or Hispanic, there's this strong relationship um, between income and, and per percent infected. And so not only do we have to understand uh, how SARS-CoV-2 is going to evolve, uh, what governs its epidemiological dynamics, the biological properties of the pathogen, what we need to understand is how in each country, in each state in a country, in each city in a country, the structural effects of things like racism, violence, xenophobia, lead to increased health burden, lead to uh, relationships between income and race ethnicity and SARS-CoV-2 that are more complicated uh, than just based on income or poverty rates alone, that what you can see is that depending on the race ethnicity, the relationship between income and SARS-CoV-2 rates uh, changes uh, dramatically. Stepping back a bit, from my perspective, one of the most influential papers uh, in the field of uh, network science and in the field of epidemiological modeling actually came out of the SARS-1 scare. And what it was doing is pointing out how if you do not take proper account of the effects of social networks on the spread of an infectious disease, you will lose the ability to generalize uh, from context to context because how you may estimate the growth rate um, can, can critically depend on the local contact network structure, meaning that if you estimate the growth rate uh, without accounting for that and then try to apply it to a location with a different contact rate, you will get a, uh, an answer that is wildly misleading. And it leads to quotes like this, uh, which are more true now of the Delta variant, uh, but is what was originally feared with SARS-1. And so this is from an a essay called The SARS Scare, saying at the height of the epidemic, this is the SARS-1 uh, epidemic, one Canadian infectious disease expert who'd come down with SARS herself predicted that the virus would spread around the globe, quoting this expert, if we don't have a virus, a vaccine, yes, we are all going to get it, she told Canadian television. And importantly, her opinion was shared uh, by many that spring. Many prominent uh, papers published um, by leading research groups projecting uh, a pandemic that did not come from, from SARS-1. And this is largely, this being the reason that uh, the pandemic risk was mis misestimated, largely comes from uh, a lack of understanding at the time in most of the community, uh, by no means all of the community, but in most of the community around what actually governs the pandemic risk. And it's in many cases, not necessarily about uh, the R naught or the average number of infections, the mean number of secondary infections, but about how variable that number is. And so this is a diagram of SARS-1 transmission in Singapore showing uh, the super spreading nature of this disease where you have a small number of individuals 
giving rise to a huge number of infections. And this super spreading nature of SARS-1, uh, one first makes it easier to control in this case, although not all cases, uh, and two means that it is likely to go extinct on its own uh, because it is only able to self-sustain because of these super spreading events. And if they are rare enough, uh, then you may end up with enough zero secondary infections be and then it goes locally extinct before uh, it hits one of these super spreading events. And so the paper I'm referring to is called Network Theory and SARS Predicting Outbreak Diversity by uh, Professor Lauren uh, Anselmeyers and colleagues. And what they showed in the paper is that you are able to get a more accurate risk characterization of SARS-1 and a more accurate estimate of what may happen with different interventions by taking a contact network approach or a social network approach. And so why am I uh, spending time on this in, in a presentation about sort of um, the importance of digital trace data of uh, measuring information online and um, social media is that one of the things that's very, very difficult, even during SARS-CoV-2, when we've gotten access to lots of data sets on this, is it's very difficult to measure these networks, to measure household size, to understand people's behavior in real time and how they're moving around. And so what I'm trying to kind of demonstrate here is why in many cases the predictions that we have, the outcomes, the interventions we might pick are so sensitive uh, to our ability to measure the system accurately that we need to have very high resolution, although still ethically um, collected and, and stored and shared uh, information on populations and what their contact network processes are, their vaccination status, their risk status, their household sizes, uh, et cetera. And so what they pointed out was that most of the models at the time, and to be honest, most of the models that are still used today um, assume that if you even have a contact network process, so let's assume that we're not talking even necessarily about random mixing, but if you just have a contact network process, that the number of secondary infections will follow a distribution that is Poisson, where the first and second moments will be equivalent to each other. You can model with a single parameter and it would lead to a transmission uh, network that looks like this. However, real world contact networks, when measured, um, are sometimes close to Poisson, but often are heavier tailed than that with quite a bit more heterogeneity. And so they showed a data set from Vancouver, British Columbia, parameterized with survey data. And of course, there have been now tens and hundreds of papers uh, published since then by some of, some of the best papers coming from people on this call, showing this effect again and again and again, that not only do you have heavier tail distributions where you can have exponential distributions or in the case of some sexually transmitted infections, things that would be sort of a finite size or truncated power law distribution, but that you have um, modular structure and hierarchical structure and a lot more richness in these networks that's gonna affect the spreading dynamics uh, than can be captured with these Poisson uh, assumptions. And so I'm just showing you uh, a very simple uh, summary of these three different Different networks that they looked at where you just have the cumulative percent on the y-axis and the degree distribution uh, the degree on the x and so you can see uh, in the diamonds in the pink diamonds the Poisson distribution that falls off very very fast um, the urban empirical data in the blue diamonds that falls off much more slowly and has a heavier tail and is well approximated by this exponential fit in the blue line and then the, the power law simulated network that they have that's, that's of finite size, but you can see again how much heavier tail that is than, than even the exponential fit. And this thinking actually leads to, uh, I think some key insights into past pandemics that either occurred or could have occurred, uh, why they didn't, and then also uh, what we may be faced with now in terms of the Delta variant. And so one of the things that it's worth remembering the 1918 flu uh, had an average or mean number of secondary infections are not of about two. The 2013-16 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, again, a very similar uh, are not of two. I, I do appreciate the fact that because this is a nonlinear system that it's saying that it's approximately two is, is a little bit hand wavy, but 
It doesn't explain the difference between a half a billion people infected in 1918 and certainly devastating in West Africa in terms of live lo lives lost, in terms of infections, in terms of the economy, but 30,000 people uh, infected as compared to, to half a billion. So something that uh, is a pandemic or would likely be considered an epidemic in the mathematical modeling sense and something that was localized um, uh, or, or regional in, in Ebola. And this difference really has a lot to do with the effect of super spreading. And so if you were to pull a data set together on a distribution of secondary infections, you would see that influenza in 1918 looks pretty close to Poisson distribution with Lambda 2, whereas the 2016 Ebola outbreak uh, has a, a mean of two, but that's because most people um, say the most common number of secondary infections is zero, and you occasionally have super spreading events of 30, 40, 50 uh, individuals. And so this was work that we did uh, very early on in, in SARS uh, CoV 2 for COVID 19 is to look at what happens in terms of the epidemic or pandemic risk when you include uh, higher moments in the distribution of secondary infections. In this case, we're using uh, the negative binomial distribution. So if you're not familiar with that, um, it has, it's a two parameter distribution for thinking about count data. And so instead of Poisson, where you have a lambda that is both the mean and the variance, you now have a parameter uh, that we're gonna call R naught that represents the mean and a second parameter, the dispersion parameter kappa that represents uh, the dispersion or the second moment uh, in this case, smaller kappa means uh, that you have a heavier tail, uh, more effective super spreading. Larger kappa means that you have uh, something that is closer and closer to Poisson. And in fact, uh, as, as kappa goes to zero, you can get something that looks like a power law, at least in the infinite limit. And as kappa goes uh, to infinity, you go to Poisson where lambda equals R naught. In practice, uh, 10 to the minus 2 is, is effectively 0, uh, and 10 uh, is effectively infinity. And so once you get kind of outside of this range of 10 to the minus 2 and 10, uh, you don't get much of a difference, at least over the r naughts that, um, that are greater than 1. And when we plug this in for what was estimated early for SARS-CoV-1, we get estimates in the final size range of, say, between 10% and 30% of the population infected. But what I want to stress here is that this modeling approach accounts for the probability that a small number of cases grows into a large number of cases. And so really the way to think about this number is this is not the proportion infected in any one given population. This is the proportion infected if you continually restart the simulation with the same population and introduce a single infected individual. And so because the R0 is up above in this case, the epidemic transition, if we weren't considering the variability, basically what this means is that if you put a single infected individual in a, an entirely susceptible population for SARS-CoV-1, there is between a 15 and 30% chance that it will take off and infect 70, 80, 90% of the population. Or to put it another way, there is between an, a 90 and a 70 and 90% chance that it will go locally extinct on its own. Okay, and so one of the features that's very important of early SARS-CoV-2 dynamics is that there was a very heavy buffer uh, that supported the non-pharmaceutical interventions. There's many examples globally in, in, that we now understand in Italy and in the US, the early places that got hit after China, that there were many introductions that did not spark uh, these, these, um, the, the big waves that occurred. And unfortunately, uh, we're seeing this now. And so, uh, these are data from a, a CDC report that was leaked yesterday. I, they're probably going to be talking about it more today since they're planning on releasing it today. Um, I, I didn't, you know, I pulled this out of the New York Times, so it's not like I have privileged information. I'm just, I'm like everybody on Twitter seeing this. So on the, the x-axis here, they have the r naught, and then the y-axis, they have the fatality rate, and they're kind of classifying these different diseases. R, the r naught is pretty unhelpful for thinking about the pandemic risk if it's less than five. And so it's actually pretty hard to compare the pandemic risk of all these different pathogens just on this single axis. But once you get up above five, there's very little effect of this over dispersion. I can show you what that looks like. So I'll use this, the same equations from this paper. 
So on the x-axis, this is the overdispersion parameter, the kappa from the negative binomial. On the y-axis, this is the final size. But the way I want you to think about this is just the probability that a single introduction grows into a large number of cases. So higher is worse. For R0-2, which is, you know, SARS-1 is probably between 2 and 3, maybe 4, you can see that uh, over this range of the published estimates of kappa, which are sort of probably between 0.3 and 1.5, depending on, on who's publishing them and, and where you're getting the data, there's between, say, like a 30 to 70 percent chance that it takes off. And so there's going to be a really strong dependence on that over dispersion. Um, however, once you get to R0-5 in black, uh, which is the low end estimate now of delta, you're looking at between 75 and 90 percent. Uh, and when you get up to R0-10, it's 80 to close to 100%. And so um, the difference between whether this is R0-5 or R0-10 turns out not to matter very much uh, in terms of the, the takeoff probability. Um, of course, the difference between R0-5 and 10 can matter a lot in terms of how fast it may end up spreading. And um, But now we put all this together, we put all this together, and this is only true for an entirely susceptible population. And we know in most countries now, even the ones that haven't received vaccinations yet, we have this complex landscape of, of immunity. We have a complex landscape of mask wearing and physical distancing of, of household distributions. And so this is gonna make it uh, very, very hard to predict the behavior in some cases of Delta because it's gonna go explosively if it lands in a, a section of the social network that has especially unvaccinated or people that haven't been previously infected before. Um, however, depending on the distribution of these individuals that are immune, um, you're gonna, you can rapidly have this thing hit, you know, parts of the network where there aren't, um, you know, there aren't any susceptible people and it, and it may die out very, very quickly. And so you can end up with this kind of patchy, uh, poppy nature to use a very deeply untechnical term uh, that can lead to some some sort of surprising looking dynamics at the population level. Uh, but I think really this paints a picture of the fact that, that this is incredibly uh, dangerous um, just because it's going to be much more deterministic uh, with with respect to um, its its dynamics. Thinking about the pre-Delta dynamics, one of the other pieces that raises the importance of these digital trace data is the reseeding effect of COVID-19. This is what I, I kind of alluded to uh, back uh, a few minutes ago about how important reintroductions were uh, for, for COVID and probably still are um, for, for the Delta variant, especially in places where you have really high levels of immunity. Um, you know, so we're talking in places like Boston, we probably have, uh, I would guess average between 75 and 90 percent immune in many of the in many neighborhoods, um, and that means that we're going to be heavily buffered even against an R not five uh, or ten pathogen, um, especially with the because the over dispersion will start to kick in there because it'll drop the R effective down into that range where the over dispersion kicks in a little bit more, but reintroductions very very important for pre delta. And this was first pointed out in two papers, one of which I was a part of, uh, the other came uh, from Professor Alessandro Vespignani's group at Northeastern, and it was led by uh, a principal researcher, um, Matteo Canazzi and graduate student Jessica Davis with, with of course a bunch of co-authors as, as all of these uh, COVID papers have really showing the importance of this interdisciplinary work. But looking at the role of mobility uh, at the global scale and across China, and how that interacts with control measures and how you have to have this kind of complete picture of, of mobility and control measures and pathogens in order to really understand what's gonna happen, uh, which is why these digital data are so important. So I'll just show you a few slides from, uh, from our paper. So we have data from Baidu, which has mobility data similar to, to Google uh, in the US and, and countries where you have a high Android penetration. And we're looking from January, across January in 2019 in gray and in red, uh, this is the uh, migration scale index um, into and out of um, Hubei province uh, where uh, Wuhan is, is located and, and the epicenter of COVID. For those of you that have worked with these kinds of data, um, 
we don't actually know what the units are on the on the y-axis and we assume that the y-axis is not linear even though it looks linear and so it's a little bit hard to understand what the gap means between uh, the, the orange and the black line so you're really just looking at the trends but importantly what you should note is that they're not that different leading up until about three days before the cordon sanitaire of, of Wuhan. And you have this big exodus of people. The mayor uh, you know, tweeted that maybe three to five million people left the city in the, in the sort of 48 to 72 hours leading up to the cordon sanitaire. And then you have this huge drop off in mobility because of the movement restrictions. And this is during the time of the Lunar New Year where you typically have pretty high levels of, of inter-province mobility uh, in, this, in this part of China. So this difference in mobility, again, we assume is nonlinear and is, and is massive. You can see again in the heat map at the bottom, just with Wuhan in the, in the dot and Hubei in gray and the movement out to the provinces um, in this part of China, um, just basically vanishing as you go um, to the end of January. And so what we showed is that the growth rate of COVID-19 at the province level was strongly affected by mobility and connectivity to Wuhan uh, prior to the cordon sanitaire. And so here we have the first week of January, each dot is the province. Um, the y-axis is the growth rate, the instantaneous growth rates a little r. And what you can see is that there's very little evidence for, for SARS-CoV-2 uh, growth. Um, it's, it's just getting started. Um, it's still probably pretty localized. As we move into January, you start to see some of these dots lifting up. So we're getting higher growth rates. And then um, as we move into the period just before the cordon sanitaire, there's, and this, uh, this is uh, basically a log log plot. So there's a very strong nonlinear relationship between mobility from Wuhan and the growth rate locally of SARS-CoV-2. The cordon sanitaire goes into effect and you see the growth rates drop, but you also see the curve dropping. And then actually goes negative when we're into the, into the cordon sanitaires and the lockdowns across China. So the places that previously had the highest growth rates and the most connectivity to Wuhan now have the largest negative growth rates. And uh, we didn't actually link this causally, but the proposed mechanism is that a lot of this growth was sustained because of these continual reintroductions from you know, what at the time was one of the biggest mega cities on the planet where you have um, a sustained uh, epidemic in the city. We see this, I'll show you some data from London with B117 that you get one of these big mega cities uh, sustaining an infection, and then the infections are moving out into smaller cities and rural areas themselves, probably not locally self-sustaining, uh, but being propped up by this continual reintroduction. This is a, a video from a paper we didn't work on, but uh, estimating that for the pre um, end of 2020 um, outbreak in Scotland and the UK, that it was somewhere around 200 separate introductions that led to uh, the sort of final takeoff there. So just a huge number of introductions before you finally get something that takes off uh, and creates the big epi curve. And Ireland had a similar estimate from the genomic data, again, suggesting you know many, many, many uh, independent introductions that launched what was called uh, you know this epidemic again at the end of 2020 and, and introduced the alpha variant or B117 at the time into Ireland. We just published a paper um, with Moritz Kramer, uh, Andrew Rambo, and Oliver Pibus, uh, and, and a huge, uh, incredible list of, of collaborators looking at these uh, invasion dynamics of, of B117 or alpha, and really showing uh, this key dependence on it becoming established in London and then mobility out of London, sustaining um, and driving um, SARS-CoV-2 B117. And so this is just a paper, we have real, uh, um, a plot, we have real-time mobility data. Each dot is a, basically a town or city um, in the UK. The lines are, are kind of shaded to represent the importance of the mobility connections. And then the red lines are showing connectivity to London. And so the other thing that happens with these big mega cities is that you also have these interregional links that jump out from them. And so if you look at other parts of, of the UK, you see a lot more kind of cycles and you know, local clustering, fewer of these sort of interregional links, but not only is it easier for these uh, pathogens to be self-sustained in a big city like London, but it's gonna be easier for them to be exported 
over much larger geographic distances because of the connectivity to these big urban uh, urban cores. And we showed uh, that the genomic data uh, recapitulates the patterns that we see in the mobility data. Um, and so one of the things that I think has become increasingly obvious, uh, although for many people on this call it was well understood prior to COVID, is the need to blend together these different data sets that provide different pieces of the story of what's happening, the digital trace data, the mobility data, the case and testing data, uh, the genomics information, the other kinds of molecular surveillance like PCR testing and wastewater. All of these tell us a little bit about this complex system, different things about the behavior, about the evolutionary patterns, about the eco ecological, epidemiological dynamics of the pathogen. We need to integrate across all these data sets in order to inform the different key components of the models and evaluate different possible policy interventions. What I want to end with is a discussion of why I think, and again, a lot of this uh, is pre-Delta. It may be that Delta is, is sufficiently um, infectious and transmissible at this point that it's basically just you were losing a lot of these complex systems dynamics because it's so, it's so deterministic uh, and is no longer sort of feeling the effects of any of these substrates anymore, um, the social network differences, the hierarchical structure. I hope I'm wrong about that because that also means that it's going to be very, very difficult to control without uh, vaccines and, and probably other non-pharmaceutical interventions, continued asymptomatic testing, et cetera. But one of the things that we know about these networks is that it's not just that they have different degree distributions. It's not just that we have to think about the first and the second moment, but that they have these sort of higher order structures that are present and can have uh, organizational effects on the epidemiological dynamics. And there's a lot of work um, that has, has um, developed these. I think for me, one of the influential papers that sort of starts a lot of this um, is the dynamical patterns of epidemic outbreaks in complex heterogeneous networks that really kind of starts developing the math and the, and the, the thinking around how we should uh, view these systems. And I'm just gonna sort of um, grossly um, oversimplify the problem with some badly drawn cartoons, but to say like the classic models, even with a network, assume that you kind of have this closed population and you have some blue susceptible individuals and you drop in a red infected individual and you watch what happens and you end up with kind of an epidemic curve where you have the proportion of infectious new infections over time and it goes up and it goes down and it's pretty symmetric, maybe not perfectly symmetric. However, we have these sort of complex hierarchical metapopulation structures where you have households that are clustered into neighborhoods that are uh, clustered into cities that go to the same workplaces and, and religious uh, uh, houses of worship and that have uh, go to the same, you know, parks and parties and or not, and that differs across space and in time, and you drop a single infected individual into this sort of hierarchical meta population, and you play out, and it's a little bit less obvious what's going to happen in terms of the epi curve. And a lot of what we do when it comes to policy interventions are focused on these epi curves. We've talked for months and months about flattening the curve. Well, that presupposes that we know what the curve looks like that we're going to flatten. Um, and in some cases, the curve actually can be intensified if you have lockdowns because you concentrate all of the social connections inside of the household and you get this quick flash of infections. It can still be better in terms of reducing the total infection burden, but can increase the simultaneous demand on the healthcare systems or can lead the public to misunderstand how these measures are gonna work because it's not going to go down right away. You're going to have a period of sustained infections as they go through the households before it actually starts to drop off. And so our ability to actually effectively communicate these policies, to pick policies that are going to be effective, uh, to understand the behavioral response, basically is fundamentally related to having the correct kinds of models uh, for the, the uh, um, epidemiological dynamics of these pathogens. A lot of this metapopulation work was developed by um, um, Vittoria Kalitza and Alessandro Vespignani in, in this paper that if you haven't read, I would encourage you uh, to read. It's been very influential for me to understand how we can think about these metapopulations and the role of this structure on, on epidemiological dynamics. And then a paper by Duncan Watts et al, Peter Dodds, specifically thinking about this hierarchical structure and what happens if you have these layers in the network. So like households, neighborhoods, uh, regions, states, international, international um, scale. And what they showed is what these epi curves will look like. So if you just have a single layer, you get a curve that looks like an epi curve. So time, infections. If you have more layers, 
this is stochastic. So you would actually have like multiple waves as it gets into different parts of the, of the network as it hits different layers as it goes from module to module, but it ends up kind of smearing out because of the effects of the stochasticity. And this kind of curve gets broader and broader and longer and almost endemic by the time you get this really very hierarchical structure. And we think this actually explains quite a bit about what's happened in different cities around the globe. I think about this continuing between Manaus and, and Sao Paulo, where you have, you know, Sao Paulo is really, it's, I mean, it's one of the biggest cities on the planet, but it's like lots and lots of little tiny cities that are aggregated into this like urban mega city. And so it's lots and lots of layers, complex uh, layers that are interacting in uh, with, you know, many, many higher order structures. And it, it basically never is going to go extinct because it's, it's moving around from different part of the city, different part of the city, different part of the city. Where in Manaus, you've got this relative, much tighter knit community. I mean, it's still a huge city, a million people, but much tighter knit community surrounded by um, essentially a massive expanse of rural area. And so you concentrate a lot more of those connections and you have something that moves much more like uh, an epidemic wave. And interestingly enough, uh, this effect was shown in what I think is one of the, the kind of most creative papers and also very influential for metapopulation dynamics, the paper by uh, professors Satinspiel and Deanne Herring, where they used data from the 1918 flu pandemic for fur traders in Canada to reconstruct the social networks and the infectious disease process based on the trading logs of people signing into these different camps and who goes missing and who shows up when. And they built a metapopulation model that was parameterized with this anthropological data and then simulated 1918 flu. And this is in a deterministic model. So you actually get this like multi-wave um, properties as it moves through this hierarchical metapopulation across what is now Northern Canada during the 1918 flu pandemic. Paper by Dalziel et al. tried to um, relate this to uh, population size of cities. And the way that they decided, because now we're stochastic, it's a little bit harder to decide like what is a peak. They're just gonna measure the width of this epidemic curve or the kind of flatness of it. So they use this measure called the epidemic intensity, which is imagine I take an epi curve and I discretize it in time and I can calculate the Shannon entropy of that curve. Uh, one over that is what we would think of as uh, the intensity. And so we're going to measure the flatness of it using the Shannon entropy, and we'll use that to calculate the intensity. So basically, how sharply peaked are these uh, epi curves? And here on the y axis, we have the proportion with influenza like illness in the United States between 2002 uh, and 2009. The 10 most intense curves, you see how sharp they are. And the 10 uh, least intense curves, you see how kind of flat they are. And we want to do this for COVID. And so what they found is that population size of the city, each dot of the city in the US population size on the X axis uh, has this inverse relationship uh, with epidemic intensity. So you actually have the sharpest curves uh, in the smallest cities. And we want to extend this a little bit closer to the, the network effect and ask, instead of just population size, let's look a little bit more at the hierarchical structure, although very coarsely, and see how that's related to the epidemic intensity. This is a paper that we published uh, that uh, Ben Rader, who's a PhD student uh, with uh, Professor John Brownstein at Boston Children's Hospital and, and Harvard, uh, Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School uh, with Moritz Kramer and, and Oliver Pibus colleagues. We took data at the time from the two countries that experienced basically their complete first waves of COVID. And this was China and Italy. And we plotted the log of the population crowding, which I'll explain in a minute against this log inverse Shannon entropy, which is our measure of the epidemic intensity. So higher on the y-axis is sharper peaked, more of your standard SIR curve, lower is broader. So higher think like what's happening in Manaus and lower think what's happening in Sao Paulo. And then the population crowding, the population crowding basically ends up being uh, the expected number of social contacts inside of a city in a uh, randomly mixing population. Um, and so what we're looking at here is something about how the organizational structure of these network of these cities is affecting the intensity uh, of, of this epidemic curve. And so in the much bigger cities like um, around China, you have a lot less uh, intense, meaning that they're longer epidemic curves. You have a higher proportion infected, infected they're longer curves then in these intense curves, but maybe in the more intense curves, you have a higher instantaneous burden on the health department. 
uh, and we have a projection of some of these epidemic intensities in different parts of, uh, of the globe here. And then we looked at the same pattern across Italy and again, see this relationship where uh, you have these longer, broader epidemic curves in the bigger cities and the sharper, intense outbreaks uh, in the comparatively uh, rural areas where the population uh, crowding is lower. And I wanna point out that um, the, as you know, um, because of the tragedies in Italy during the first wave, um, that the epidemic curves vary over um, many orders of magnitude in terms of the number of people that were infected in different parts of China and different parts of Italy. And then of course, given the vast differences in the population size, the crowding uh, is over many orders of magnitude. And so it turns out that this relationship is at least three orders of magnitude in terms of um, um, intensity and population crowding across China and Italy that this, uh, this pattern holds. We then embedded this into a simulation model where we can vary uh, the hierarchical structure in a, in a more sophisticated way than just population crowding. So we actually have layers that we embed into the network. And look what happens when you have a, a much sparser network versus a more crowded network as you have more layers that are present. And what we showed, and this is work in the paper that uh, Professor Allison Hill's group led, is that in the sparse case, you get this single epi curve. So the black is the sort of average over many runs the blue is just a few um, kind of individual simulations that are represented. In the more crowded case, you see these like broader curves, although some of them still go quickly. There's some effect of stochasticity. However, once we put in interventions, namely a lockdown, in this case, what happens with the lockdown is you concentrate your social connections into the household. And so in the case of this, the already sparse curve, you do kind of flatten it a bit. But in the case of the more crowded network, you actually intensify it a bit because more of these social connections are inside the household where the infection risk is higher. Now, in this case, you still end up with a smaller proportion infected. So overall, it's better in terms of reducing uh, the infections in terms of saving lives, but you actually don't flatten the curve, you intensify the curve. And so this is what I mean about understanding the mechanism so that we can better communicate what's going to happen when we roll out these policy interventions. And some cities and towns, you will flatten the curve with these interventions and others, you will actually intensify the curve. Uh, but in both cases, you're likely to save lives um, and, and in some cases reduce the instantaneous healthcare burden. We then take this model, be interesting to go back and check this now, we haven't, but we take this model and project the epidemic intensity globally in places that had not yet experienced uh, their, their first waves of COVID-19. And this, of course, uh, this interaction between human behavior um, policy interventions, uh, travel uh, is well known in this space. This is a paper by uh, Maloney et al. Uh, looking at what happens with human mobility and response to large scale spreading of in infectious diseases and looking at the airline network in the US. And so what we wanted to then kind of try and gain an understanding of is what's happening with these human behavioral responses. And I'm gonna apologize that this is so US centric, but the way that I'm gonna justify it is to say that one of the reasons that studying behavior is so hard is that behavior varies internationally, nationally, and locally, just like we're seeing for COVID, just like we're seeing for vaccination. And this is part of the reason why we need these large, broad comparative studies, but also studies that are representative of the global diversity in the way that policies are interacted, in the way that people make decisions, the way that behaviors influence the mobility patterns, et cetera. So I'll show you some data from the US, but really just to motivate the fact that this is the kind of work, the kind of understanding that we need globally because the reactions are gonna be different, the policy options are different, the decision makers are different. And, and now the viruses are different, right? That we have all these variants that are in different parts of the US, different parts of the globe, and in other countries, different parts of the country, et cetera, competing with different variants that were there previously. So we did a survey, this is work led by Ben Rader and, and Professor John Brownstein. We did a survey with uh, SurveyMonkey in the US of 400,000 people on self-reported mask wearing behavior. And we find a very strong effect of mask wearing. So on the Y axis, these are four different buckets based on the percent that said they're very likely to wear a face mask with family or friends. Uh, interestingly in the US, 
the proportion, this is back last summer, the proportion last summer across the U.S. that said they wore masks in the grocery stores is close to 100%. There's very little variation across the U.S. in that. The variability is people wearing masks with family and friends in other settings. And here we have the instantaneous reproductive number or the RT that's measured uh, in time in different counties, which are the dots. And so one is meaning this is coming under control a little bit more. And so as you go from 28% or less wearing masks to 30 to 40 to over 50%, you see this distribution dropping down lower and lower and lower. And this is self-reported mask wearing behavior. But what we see, and this has been validated in many other studies, is that masks work uh, to control COVID-19 if you get the mask wearing numbers up high enough. Uh, and you have people that are wearing them correctly, and, and especially if they have high filtration masks. However, what we found via this seg seg segmented regression model is that there's no effect of statewide mandates on the percent that report that they wear masks. So I'll say that again. There's no observable statistical effect of mandates on self-reported mask wearing behavior. And for those of you that have worked in public health, you know this is not a surprise, right? So most of what happens with these mitigation measures, uh, think about condom wearing, for example, is about education and access, right? And so individuals need to have access to masks and they need to be educated and they need buy-in and community engagement to understand the importance uh, of wearing them. And so most of these decisions, at least in the US, are being made at the neighborhood level, at the household level around where, whether we're gonna wear masks or not. And I think that's part of the reason that many public health agencies um, are struggling with these infodemics is that the sort of top-down messaging is very hard to influence behavior. Uh, whereas the infodemics that we're talking about, you're often looking at these sort of bottom-up uh, grassroots organizations in terms of how they're spreading and where they're being introduced and how the messaging is being crafted. And that's more at the scale where people are making their decisions in their households, with their family members, with their friends. And so I think that one of the things that this is telling us from COVID is that we need to uh, kind of take the battle of infodemics um, down to the individual and household messaging level and understand that individuals are going to be making these decisions uh, based on who they're listening to in their trusted networks. Um, where they're getting their information from, and that it's going to be often very individualized, very household level, very neighborhood level, and that the top-down messaging, the enforcement, um, is very unlikely to be effective. I mean, one of the areas where we see that's not the case, of course, is with vaccinations, uh, with the vaccine mandates, but that requires a lot of effort and investment around enforcement, and of course, we know you get a lot of pushback uh, for, from that as well. We see the same thing in terms of the mobility data. Uh, so here's data that's coming uh, again from Professor Alessandro Vespignani's group at Northeastern. Uh, the COVID Mobility Project is also in collaboration with um, individuals kind of internationally and, and around the greater Boston area and, and the company Cubic to look at anonymized uh, mobility data. So here we have the sort of typical behavior. Uh, so 100% is like think pre-pandemic normal. Uh, over time uh, in 2020, starting in uh, mid-February and in blue, this is the Boston area. In orange, this is a place in North Carolina, Raleigh-Durham, if you're familiar with it, it's near where kind of Duke University is. In yellow, this is a part of Florida. And in green, which you can't really see because it's basically following Florida and North Carolina, is the US average. And watch the curves as you go from February into early March, starting about March 7th, they drop dramatically. This is weeks before the governor in Massachusetts closed the non-essential businesses. People had already locked themselves down, anyone that had the privilege to do that because they were scared. They were hearing messaging from the U.S. They were seeing what was happening uh, in Italy, who was two weeks before in terms, of, in terms of their epidemic trajectory. And so people make decisions based on information they're getting from all kinds of sources. And if they have the ability to lock down if they have the privilege to work from home, they start doing so well before the mandates go into place. And we see the reverse effect uh, where these mobility patterns, depending on whether we're looking at commute flow or movement for restaurants or school or regional mobility or airline travel, they're all coming back at different rates in different parts of the world, in different parts of the US. And that means that 
you know, one of the reasons why, for example, models from uh, COVID from certain research groups failed is to make predictions is that they had these sort of phenomenological scenarios that said, okay, if you have a mandate in place around business closure, uh, then here's the reduction in transmissibility. Well, Massachusetts never had a shelter in place order. They closed businesses and there was a very stern warning from the governor to stay home, but we never had the kind of orders enforced by the government in Massachusetts the way you know you had in Italy and many other countries in China. But we had less mobility than neighboring states in the US that had enforced orders. And we had mobility in Massachusetts that was down at levels like what we saw in Italy where they had uh, enforced, um, enforced mobility restrictions. And so again, what this means is that we need to understand human behavior, which is of course very hard, maybe it's impossible, but we have to understand human behavior we have to have sophisticated, uh, equitable, and ethically responsible instruments to measure it and monitor it in real time, because otherwise we are not going to have the kinds of data we need uh, to make these forecasts accurate enough. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I think it's so important that we're investing heavily uh, in data infrastructure, but data infrastructure that is uh, respects sovereignty, respects privacy, uh, is ethically responsible, uh, but can be used uh, during these pandemic situations to understand how people are moving around, how they're making decisions, how they're responding to policy interventions, all of these things that are going to affect uh, uh, the pandemic. And I do not want to talk about this. I don't know why these are here. I left these slides in by mistake. Um, let me see here. So uh, the last thing uh, that I want to end with, and then I'll just spend a few minutes uh, telling you a little bit about what we started doing at the Pandemic Prevention Institute and then open up for questions is, and again, I'm focusing on the U.S. because that's what I understand better, but you can replace uh, these names with the, the racial, ethnic, uh, indigenous groups that are being marginalized globally. Um, I showed you the data on infections hitting communities that are majority, minority in the United States harder. Uh, lower vaccination rates. Um, one of the things that we hear about low vaccination rates in minority communities in the U.S. Uh, is because of a distrust uh, for the government, and that's true. The government has abused um, and and you know enacted violence against minority communities in the U.S. for uh, 200 years. Um, however, in the city of Boston, we did not have a vaccination clinic in a majority minority neighborhood until months into the vaccination campaign. And so one of the big issues around vaccination is that we are not engaging with community leaders. We're not building trust. We're not taking vaccines into the communities uh, that, that need them uh, and have not yet received them. And so very similar to the infodemic issue, very similar to the top-down enforcement not working, one of the things that also doesn't work is just to say, well, there's vaccine hesitancy, there's nothing we can do. Well, there is something you can do. You can go into the communities, you can engage with trusted leaders, you can build trust, you can provide access. Uh, one of the things we haven't done, of course, internationally outside of the US is, is export the vaccines, right? And so it's very hard to say, um, well, here are the issues of hesitancy. Here's what's happening with the spread of these variants uh, when we have this massive inequity and inequality in terms of accessibility, in terms of how the information campaigns are built, in terms of how we try to understand human behavior. Uh, but I want to quote from this uh, Medium article back in 2020 by Grace Knopper. And so when I mentioned, you know, in Boston that we had 20% infected in the first wave, that's because in some neighborhoods that were predominantly early generation immigrants, Black, Hispanic, you have 30, 40% of the population infected because they can't stay home. They have to go to work. Uh, they're not uh, in the privileged position to work remotely. Whereas in other neighborhoods that are majority white, you have um, two, three percent of the population infected because everybody's able to lock down. And so as the COVID-19 epidemic continues to ravage the American public, and you could replace this globally, uh, you look internationally, uh, indigenous populations hit incredibly hard, um, populations of individuals that have refugee status that are displaced hit incredibly hard. An unsurprising story emerges, poor communities are hotspots for COVID-19 transmission. I would actually say in the data that we have for Massachusetts suggests that it's not just poor communities, it's actually individuals that are in racial or ethnic minorities that are being hit harder, that poverty does not, in the US, poverty does not transcend uh, race, racism. It does not transcend xenophobia. Uh, what we see very clearly is that it is the impoverished minority communities that are hit harder. 
uh, the death rate from COVID-19 is staggeringly high among African Americans. The Washington Post, Post reports 14% of the state of Michigan is black. 14% of the state. 40% of COVID-19 deaths are among blacks. 40% of deaths, 14% of the state. In Boston, we used age-based cutoffs uh, for vaccination. In the state of Massachusetts and the US, most countries did globally. That seems like a good idea because individuals have much higher risk of mortality in older age groups. Well, the first age ban in the US was above the median age, the median life expectancy in some minority neighborhoods in Boston. They weren't even eligible for the vaccine above the median age. And so not only are we not talking about equity, we haven't reached equality in terms of just proportions of, of the population. And this is one of the things that we have to engage with and partly why I think this community of ours is so important in terms of taking the leadership here is that we have people that work as sociologists that understand human behavior, that understand the systematic effects of racism, that know how all of these pieces or at least are studying how all of these pieces fit together to have the anthropological experience people that have the technology backgrounds that understand the digital trace data, the social media uh, infodemics, people that understand the sort of physics of these socio-technical systems and the way an infectious disease is gonna move through them. And only by bringing all these people together, all of these minds, all of these different ways of thinking, all of the diversity, are we going to be able to really um, exit from this pandemic uh, at all, if ever, uh, and prevent this uh, from happening again? And so one of the reasons, again, that I, um, kind of end with by saying that COVID-19 became a pandemic because the world doesn't understand complex systems is not only is this a scientific problem, uh, not only is this a problem that the public health decision makers don't have enough training and experience in how to manage and deal with these complex systems, but even within the sciences, even within academia, we're still fighting these battles of the importance of interdisciplinary work, of the importance of these uh, trans and interdisciplinary centers where we bring together minds with different kinds of training and expertise, people from different countries, different parts of countries, different backgrounds and histories and experiences so that we can construct a coherent narrative and story that brings together all of these different features that affect the emergent properties uh, that are so consequential in our lives like pandemics. And that's exactly what uh, I came to the Rockefeller Foundation, the Pandemic Prevention Institute, uh, to try and do is to bring this complex system style, this integrative thinking and help us build an equitable, ethically responsible data system that provides information uh, and data to the groups that are building models, to the public health officials that are making decisions to empower them uh, to make better decisions faster, save lives, improve policy decision-making practices but to do so in such a way that respects sovereignty, that respects privacy, so that we can, you know, of course, you can never fully respect privacy once data are collected. As soon as they're out there, there will be ways to take advantage of it. But that doesn't mean that we can't bring the best minds in the security space, in the ethics space, in the legal and regulatory spaces to understand how do we optimize for the maximum possible utility around data to save lives and prevent pandemics while also protecting privacy. Uh, protecting sovereignty and ensuring uh, that these data are used uh, equitably uh, and not used to further disempower communities that are not used to pass the responsibility on uh, to already uh, impoverished communities. And so that's uh, what I'm bringing uh, to the Pandemic Prevention Institute. And one of the reasons why we're hiring so broadly across individuals that work in complex systems, uh, that work as technologists that understand data systems, ethics, security, that understand the different modalities of data that we're working on from the digital trace to the genomics to traditional epidemiological data to try to build that complex system into uh, the Pandemic Prevention Institute and bring the style of thinking uh, to the global stage uh, and into the policy spheres so that we can um, be prepared for the next pandemic and also ex exit as quickly uh, and equitably uh, from this pandemic as possible. And so I want to thank again, um, McKelly for the, the wonderful introduction, the organizers uh, for uh, having me, uh, all of you for your attention, again, for your um, willingness to allow me the 24 hour delay uh, in, pre in presenting. I believe we have 
uh, either I went over by 10 minutes or we have 20 minutes uh, for a discussion. And so hopefully we do. And I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to open it up to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. I think uh, uh, the 24 hours in labor really, it was really worth the waiting because I mean, the, this was really a, an inspiring talk. I think uh, uh, you, you have uh, touched so many important points and uh, I'm also very, I'm really glad you, you managed to, um, to show some uh, foundational papers uh, of, of uh, computational epidemiology, with ep epidemiology, spatial epidemiology, like the Sutton spill something that uh, is almost forgotten, but then, I mean, the students can know what, where the origin are from, I mean, uh, or in that case. And also, I, I'm really glad uh, you mentioned all this, this, this uh, debate uh, and all the, 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 the part uh, about inequalities and vulnerabilities, because I mean, this is clearly a major, uh, a major issue that we, we discovered, I mean, during the pandemic, how much segregation uh, impacts the pandemic and the other way around. So um, uh, everything is so important. Uh, so yeah, uh, we have, um, of course, yeah, uh, rooms for, for room for questions. Uh, and uh, um, I invite uh, uh, everyone who wants to, 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 to ask questions uh, to put in the chat, first of all. Um, can, you, uh, can you read the, the chat, Sam? Yes, so I'll, I'll read. Um... The, the question, so it's from, uh, I'll just say everybody's first name, uh, since I don't, yeah. I don't know Francesco, if you're yeah. doctor or professor or, or, or any, but so, so Francesco, uh, so, <laughs> okay, or do you want to ask the question since you're off mute or? Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Yes, I, I mean, because you showed the, for example, minorities of people being worried. Uh, I, I was wondering if, or, um, on possible causes, let's say, and I was wondering in, if it's possible to, do, to uh, evaluate if uh, it can be due to, for example, different uh, habits on personal behavior of uh, the people, let's say, rather than, for example, different way of um, different uh, availability of, on access to healthcare, so let's say form of discrimination. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So is there a way to understand the, um, you know, different ways in which individuals are um, living out their lives versus the effects of discrimination? I actually think, I, I think those are at least in the US where I understand the situation better. I think those are pretty much uh, impossible to separate uh, because, um, you know, and, and, you know, every country has its own story. But of course, you know, because the U.S. was founded um, on slavery and had um, such a huge uh, organizational period of um, inequality and racism uh, that's still that's still here, uh, that you can't actually separate out the effects of that from uh, anything else that are happening. So the you know higher health burdens, the access to healthcare, all of that is is organized around. These, uh, these effects of, of racism, the, you know, in terms of the ability to shelter in place uh, based on individuals' jobs. So you do see different mobility patterns in, in impoverished minority communities in the US um, because they have to go to work um, during COVID uh, if they're gonna continue to earn, uh, you know, to earn a paycheck. It's one of the reasons why, um, you know, this, the stimulus payments that we finally got were so important uh, for actually slowing down some of the, the transmission is that there are huge percentages of the U.S. that lose their health insurance or can't afford it or won't be able to pay their rent. That's why we had to have the eviction moratoriums. And so some of this is also a U.S. specific problem. Like um, I'm not really allowed to talk that much about like politics because of Rockefeller's tax status, but I'll just say that like, you know, we don't have universal uh, basic income. We don't have uh, universal health care. We don't have very much in the way of protection of tenants' rights for people that are leasing. We did finally during um, during the pandemic, and so some of some of this is specific to the U.S. where it's just impossible to pull those two apart. Um, but I think it is it is really important that we have like an international audience of collaborators come together because every country is going to be different in terms of you know what what social um, systems they have in place to protect individuals who are in these 
um, you know, communities that have experienced racism or or other forms of of structural violence. Um, so in some places it may be possible, um, and and in other places, you know, it, it isn't going to be possible just because those things are are just perfectly correlated and it's causal in in the case of the U.S. Thanks. Uh, other questions? Um, uh, otherwise, I mean, I just I just would like to ask you because I think here is a is, is a great moment to uh, let's say to speculate about the future, <laughs> even if uh, um, we of course we don't know. But uh, so I, I feel right now. I mean, what, what is your your feeling about the need uh, uh, so further use of non pharmaceutical interventions now that vaccines available? So. Do you, do you still think that it will be needed uh, or it, and actually people will accept those? Uh, and, and on the other side also, I mean, the vaccine is available. I mean, uh, I had also a conversation with Marcel Salate a, 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 few, a few weeks ago. And basically he was saying, I mean, now COVID-19 is, is becoming a vaccine preventable disease. And now, now uh, if one year ago, it was not anymore. So at a certain point, uh, uh, still, I mean, you could say, well, just just get vaccinated, uh, and and then those who are vaccinated will continue their life, going on with their life. And if you don't want to get the vaccine, then you you take the risk. But again, I mean, the, all all this type of, of biases in the access to vaccine that you mentioned, I mean, make this kind of reasoning a, a bit uh, also um, unfair, right? So I was uh, yeah, it's no, it's a great point, and I um. I mean, a lot has a lot has happened in the last sort of 36 hours. With it seeming like the CDC in the U.S. has better data. Who knows? We haven't seen it yet, but better data on whether breakthrough infections from Delta and vaccinated people whether they're transmitting as much um, as as the unvaccinated uh, infections. And I mean, so that the challenge there then is like, you know, in the U.S., you have to be 12 years or older to get vaccinated. That means that most of the families will have children in the household that can't be vaccinated. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think that means that you have to have testing and mask wearing um, because we know that, that the, the asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission is part of how this thing went pandemic because we are focused on temperature screens and symptomatic screening uh, and we missed we missed the asymptomatic carriage uh, and, and transmission. Um, as you pointed out, I mean, the vaccines are not available in most countries at high rates, uh, you know, outside of, you know, Europe is finally catching up uh, to the US and UK, Canada now. Um, I, I think one of the, I, I, my concern right now in the short term is there's gonna be an, an ugly feedback loop. Um, in, so the US I think was like finally warming up to this idea of, of actually sharing some vaccines in part because we've got all these vaccines just sitting around that nobody's using. And now the vaccination rates are going up again because of Delta. And so I think what's gonna happen is that that's gonna put political pressure to keep the vaccines yes. in the US. Uh, yes. and, and instead we were just about to start to, to ship them off. Um, but then, but so, then another variant will come out. <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, and I think for me, the piece that and I, I don't, I'm not an immunologist. I, I agree with sort of uh, what Ed Young said about like how immunology is like a board game with 25,000 pieces and 50 pages of instructions. And occasionally somebody just lights the whole game on fire um, when he wrote about it. So, but I will say that from what I've read, it, it looks like a large part of the problem for the severe cases is autoimmune or, or a type reaction. And if that's true, it may be the case that there, we're not going to see a variant that really lowers the protection of the vaccine for severe disease below, you know, much below 90, 85%, for example. And if that's the case, um, what that means is that we have to get everybody vaccinated. We've got to do it. As, I mean, we need to do that anyways. But now we're in this space with Delta where it's so, it, it could be so infectious. Um, that it's just going to sweep through and get ev everybody who's not vaccinated. And that means that we just have to go for it as fast as we can, as safely as we can. Um, and this is, a, this is the case where I do think the top-down things we know will work, right? I mean, you see in France, they, they say, look, if you, don't, if you don't have the vaccination status, 
you're not getting on the trains. Um, and then all of a sudden, as well as like 2 million people got vaccinated in the first like th three days after that announcement or something, right? And so I think, you know, in the US, we still have the federal mask mandate for airlines. Um, there's a rumor that President Biden is considering the mass, the vaccine mandate for any international travel. The man, what the federal government can do is a little bit confusing and what they can't do, uh, but they definitely have the full authority over international travel for U.S. citizens in terms of who can come back and who can leave the country. So they can definitely put that in place. Um, so I, to, to kind of come back to it again and answer the question, I think, and I've been saying this since we started to vaccinate people, that the vaccines work better when there's less COVID around. Um, yeah. If the COVID rates are lower, the vaccine, the breakthrough rates are lower just because of statistics. Um, and I think once you start to have these flare-ups, we've got to put the masks on. We've got to have the group size limit so you don't have the super spreading events. Um, anything we can do uh, to get that rate down. And the, the earlier we do it, the easier it's going to be in terms of avoiding the lockdowns, in terms of the length of time that we have to keep the masks on. And that's part of what I'm excited to work on at, at the, the Pandemic Prevention Institute is that, you know, I have my phone and my phone will tell me if I need an umbrella before I go outside. It's not always right. Sometimes I get rained on and sometimes I carry it around. I don't need it, but it's right more than it's wrong, I think. And, you know, we could have these kind of risk assessments that are much more granular that say that you need to wear the masks today, um, you know, or you should avoid we, for the next week, we need to avoid groups of more than five outside of your household or something. And this would make it a lot more localized and would mean that the whole state or the whole country doesn't have to go into the same strategy depending on what's happening in their local region. People make more decisions uh, based on having this, you know, higher quality information. And so I think we need to get a lot more adaptive uh, around, around these non-pharmaceutical interventions, but um, I don't see any way around them at this point in, unless we can figure out how to get the vaccine equity up quickly. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I agree. Uh, so the, I don't know if there's, there are any more questions, uh, you can put it on the chat. Um, and uh, uh, otherwise, um, yeah, I think, yeah. We can just, uh, I really want to thank Sam Scarpino again for, um, for his presentation for, I mean, I think it was a perfect uh, uh, final presentation for, for the school, uh, really a, an excellent wrap up of the pandemic and what we know and we still don't know about the, the, the pandemic and uh, definitely uh, a great, great presentation. So I want to thank again, Sam Scarpino, thank you for, for your time. Uh, and uh, then I want to thank uh, you all. I mean, the, all the students. Uh, we have, we managed for you managed to 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 reach the end of the of the five days. So, thanks to all of you who uh, kept strong until uh, the the final uh, the very final presentation. Um, and uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, we are gonna uh, meet tomorrow uh, for the final uh, uh, meeting and for the for the, the presentation of the group projects. Uh, so I have sent the invite to all of you. And uh, well, thanks again. Thanks, Sam. Uh, it was great. Uh, and uh, have, a, have a good day uh, and, uh, and a good evening to, to the rest uh, of, of the group. And, and see you soon. I mean, like, I don't have a, um, maybe you can stop recording, but I just, yeah. it's just yeah. a